Greetings aspirants, welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 10th of August 2022. So displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. We have five different news articles. Followed by that we will be discussing some of the preliminary practice questions and I will post a quiz question for you in the poll section. Try to answer that question also. So now without much delay, let us move on to the first news article discussion. Now let us take up this text and context article for our discussion. See it is about the SSLV D1 EOS2 mission. Don't panic, UPSC will not expect you to memorize this name. See the news is the launch vehicle SSLV carried two satellites and both of them were lost because of the inability to place them in the required orbits. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about the mission in detail and the reasons for its failure. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Just go through it. Now let's start our discussion. See as I already said, under this mission, the launch vehicle was carrying two satellites. One of them is the Earth Observation Satellite 2, that is EOS 2 and it weighed about 135 kg. And the other one is the Azadi Sat, which weighed about 8 kg. So what is the purpose of this mission? See, the purpose was to place these two satellites in circular low Earth orbits at a height of about 350 km above the equator. So here you must understand what is a low Earth orbit. See, a low Earth orbit or shortly called as LEO is an orbit that is relatively close to Earth's surface. See, as per NASA, it is normally at an altitude of less than 2000 km but could be as low as 160 km above Earth. So here you might have a doubt why it is called low Earth orbit but its altitude ranges from 160 km to 2000 km. See, the answer to this is this altitude that is 160 km to 2000 km above Earth is considered low when compared to other orbits. So when compared to other satellite orbits, this particular altitude is considered as the lowest. That is why the name low Earth orbit is given to it. And even 160 km is very far away from Earth's surface. For comparison, let us take an aeroplane. They fly at an altitude of 14 km above Earth. I hope now you can understand how far away 160 km from Earth's surface will be. Now, what is the significance of LEO? See, LEO's close proximity to Earth makes it useful for several reasons. It is the orbit most commonly used for satellite imaging. This is because the proximity to the surface of the Earth allows it to take images of high resolution. And it is also the orbit used for the International Space Stations, that is ISS, as it is easier for astronauts to travel to and from the ISS to Earth. One more important significance is that, unlike satellites in geostationary orbits, LEO satellites do not always have to follow a particular path around Earth in the same way. The plane of LEO satellites can be tilted for our convenience. This means that there are more available routes for satellites in LEO. And this is one of the reasons why LEO is a very commonly used orbit. Now here I have a task for you. Go and read about geostationary orbits and find out how it is different from LEO. If possible, read about all the satellite orbits, then it will be a revision for you. And it is a very important topic with respect to preliminary examination. So now coming back to our discussion, we were seeing about the purpose of the mission. Now let us see about the purpose of the satellites. See first, let us see about the Earth Observation Satellite that is EOS-2. See it is the largest one and it was designed and developed by ISRO. This satellite offered advanced optical remote sensing operations. 
if placed correctly in the orbit it would have operated in the infrared region and could have several many purposes the purposes ranges from imaging for climate studies to simply keeping an eye on earth now the second satellite azadi sat see this particular one was a collection of 75 tiny payloads weighing around 50 grams each and these were integrated by students it carried tiny experiments which would have measured the ionizing radiation in its orbit if placed correctly in the orbit and it also contained a transponder which works in the ham radio frequency that is this particular frequency helps in non commercial exchange of messages and emergency communications so this is about two satellites so now we know about the purpose of the satellite and the mission now we need to understand why the mission failed or what caused the failure See the launch vehicle SSLV was composed of three stages powered by solid fuels and here there is no problem at all these three performed their function as planned the problem came in the stage where the satellites had to be put in orbit as per ISRO there was a malfunctioning of a sensor which resulted in placing the satellites in an elliptical orbit rather than a circular orbit See we all know what a circular orbit looks like right so imagine that in your mind see the ellipse or oval shape of the elliptical orbit is elongated in one direction and compressed in another the shortest height above the earth of this oval orbit was only about 76 km see here you must know that satellites that orbit the earth are mostly placed in circular orbits One reason is that if the orbits is used for imaging the earth it will be easier if it has a fixed distance from the earth if the distance keeps changing like in an elliptical orbit keeping the cameras focused can become complicated and this is why in this mission also the purpose was to place the satellites in circular low earth orbit since they contained earth observation systems So from this we can come to the conclusion that the mission's intention is to place the satellites in a circular orbit but it placed it in an elliptical orbit now you may have a doubt the satellite could have served their purpose in the elliptical orbit itself right then why did the satellite get lost so here only there is a problem see as we already saw the closest distance to the earth is only 76 km in case of an elliptical orbit In such an altitude an atmospheric drag will be experienced by the object so if adequate thrust is not applied to overcome the drag it will lose height and fall towards the earth due to gravity and eventually it will burn up due to friction and this is exactly why we lost the satellites see the rocket technology has progressed a lot over the years even if the course of the rocket is altered from its planned course there will be sensors which will trigger a course correction and this in turn will restore the trajectory of the rocket there will also be many sensors as well as a built in redundancy that is even if one or two sensors fail there will be other to take over and affect the course correction we have reached this point in rocket technology but the present case implies that either redundancy was not built in or perhaps it was built in but did not work due to a technical glitch now another question was also asked regarding the failure why did isro prefer sslv over pslv or gslv see pslv that is polar satellite launch vehicle and gslv geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle are quite powerful and they can carry huge loads to place an earth orbiting satellite in a low earth orbit we do not need so much power the sslv can easily carry small to medium loads from 10 kg to 500 kg it is less expensive another advantage is that the three stages are powered by solid fuel see solid fuel is easier to handle whereas handling the liquid propellants used in the pslv and the gslv is more complex 
and because of these reasons only is or preferred sslv over pslv or gslv so that's all about this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw in detail about the sslv d1 eos2 mission the purpose of the satellite the reason for failure of mission and why sslv was preferred by isro so with these learned points in mind now let us move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this news article talks about the silent marches centered on 75 refugee colonies see last year our prime minister announced that august 14th of every year will be remembered as partition horrors remembrance day from 2022 onwards this event will be commemorated with silent marches so that is why this article has made news so taking this as an opportunity let us quickly go through the timeline of partition which will be very helpful for your preliminary examination see the background of the partition is considered a crucial event in the independence campaign of india and the idea of partition sprouted way back in the year 1905 itself so what do you remember when you hear the year 1905 yes it is the year when the partition of bengal took place and as a result of that we indians proceeded with swadeshi movement see the partition of bengal is nothing but a plan to partition the bengal during the regime of lord curzon the partition divides the province between west bengal whose majority was hindu and east bengal whose majority was muslim so this instigated the muslim leaders in promoting the idea of a separate muslim state more vigorously than ever this is because due to lot of incidents they naturally developed the fear against the utter dominance of the hindus they feared that if india becomes an independent country in the future only hindus will be dominating the country so the idea of separate state for muslims sprouted during this partition of bengal in 1905 and just what the british wished for happened many protest movements and communal riots continued in bengal during that period but the partition was done and the aim of britishers to dissolve the sense of nationalism among the indians succeeded and after this through the indian councils act 1909 the british introduced the involvement of indians in the governance of british india also this act introduced a separate electorate for muslims for the first time so this is a second instance however the british tolerance towards the muslim community was questioned in the 1916 conference of the congress see at this conference the congress members they discussed about the british aggression against the turkish sultan the muslim leaders suspected the actual motive of the british raj behind supporting the muslim interest in india and later the historic lucknow pact brought both the all india national congress and the muslim league together which held on the year 1916 and during this event the muslim leaders accepted terms of not opposing the congress reforms in turn the leaders of the congress party they approved distinct muslim electorates this was both in imperial legislative assembly as well as the state legislatures and the upcoming years that followed the lucknow pact witnessed the potential benefits of the hindu muslim unity the pact proved to be beneficial for both the muslim majority and minority classes in the north western frontier and the eastern provinces of bengal and bihar the leaders of the two dominant political halves here we are talking about the all india national congress and the muslim league they both decided to set aside their conflicts and fight against the british east india company so this lucknow pact 1916 played a huge role in the background of the partition next comes the montagu chelmsford reforms See based on the facts and figures related to the voting eligibility finally the government of india act was enacted by viceroy lord chelmsford in the year 1919 it was referred as the montagu chelmsford reforms see this act extended to all the legislative councils be it that of the provinces or that of the imperial legislative bodies 
vital departments like foreign affairs defensive administration and criminal justice continued to be handled by the british raj while the less impactful duties like the public health revenue administration primary education and state government were handed over to the official majority classes of the concerned provinces in no way this move justified the demands put forward by the muslim league as the reforms merely gave limited power to the communities who dominated the population at a particular place this generated a sensation among the muslims that by no means the british government is going to put the effort into establishing the muslim authority in undivided india this further fueled their demand for an independent nation then came the world war 2 See in 1939 British took India into the World War 2 without consultation Congress opposed it obviously at that time large nationalist protest began and it culminated into the 1942 quit india movement See two days back that is August 8th remarks the 80th anniversary of quit india movement See once in our UPSC preliminary examination This date was particularly mentioned in the question paper and asked to which movement this date belongs to okay so on august 8th of 1942 quit india movement culminated as you know this is a mass movement against british rule for being a part in it nehru and gandhi and thousands of congress workers were imprisoned until 1945 Meanwhile the British war time needed for local allies that is they needed local association to win the war and for that the britishers they gave the muslim league an opening to offer its cooperation in exchange for future political safeguards followed by that in march 1940 the muslim league's pakistan resolution was passed and this resolution demand for creation of separate state to accommodate indian muslims so after the war at least labor government in london recognized that britain's devastating economy could not cope with the cost of the over extended empire so a cabinet mission was dispatched to india in the early 1946 then an act of parliament proposed June 1948 as the deadline for the transfer of power but the mission failed to secure agreement over its proposed constitutional scheme which recommended a loose federation so as the mission suggested a loose federation the mission failed and this idea was rejected by both congress and the muslim league muslim league moved to agitate for pakistan by any means possible So this was the situation back then followed by that by March 1947 a new viceroy Lord Louis Mountbatten arrived in Delhi with a mandate to find a speedy way of bringing the British Raj to an end So on June 3rd he announced that independence would be brought forward to August that year that is in 1947 then he presented politicians with an ultimatum that gave them little alternative but they were in a situation to agree to the creation of two separate states and finally pakistan its eastern and western wings separated by around 1700 kilometers of indian territory they celebrated independence on august 14 1947 india did the same celebration of independence on august 15 1947 and thus the new borders which split the key provinces of the punjab and bengal into two were officially approved on august 17 they had been drawn up by a boundary commission led by british lawyer cyril ratcliffe and this partition triggered riots mass casualties and a colossal wave of migration both states subsequently faced huge problems accommodating and rehabilitating post partition refugees even today the two countries relationship is far from healthy still kashmir remains a flashpoint 7 decades on but well over a billion people still live in the shadow of partition so that's all you have to know about the timeline of partition of our country in this news article discussion we in detail saw about the background of the partition how the idea sprouted 
how it evolved and finally how two state was attained so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion see this article here it says that tamil nadu chief minister has written to his kerala counterpart reassuring him that the mullai periyara dam was safe and the flood regulations was being done as per the rule curve and gate operation schedule approved by the central water commission in february 2021 so this is about the news article given here in this context let us understand about the location of the dam and some important details about periyar river first of all let us begin with knowing about the river see periyar river is the longest river in kerala and it is known to have the largest discharge potential the river is the source of drinking water for towns and cities in kerala it is a perennial river which is known as lifeline or pulse of kerala so now with this basic understanding let us see about the origin of the river see periyar arises from the sivagiri peaks of sundaramala in tamil nadu so the river is formed at the border of tamil nadu in western ghats from here it moves towards the north where a westward flowing tributary mullayar joins the river and also the river flows through a tiger reserve called periyar tiger reserve at the downstream it forms a border between the periyar section of the reserve in the east and the sundaramala section in the west where it originates and after this it falls into the periyar lake so in simple words the river flows north and then enters kerala it moves northwest through the mountains and on to the coastal plains north of kochi and finally the river empties into the arabian sea know that a mullai periyar dam is built at the point where periyar and mullayar meet and forms the periyar lake a major part of the dam including the catchment area is situated in kerala's idikki district although the 126 years old mullai periyar dam is located in kerala it is operated by the government of tamil nadu which signed a 999 year lease agreement with the former british government to irrigate farm land on its side see on october 29 1886 a lease indenture was signed between maharaja of trivankur named visaham tirunal rama varma and the british india's secretary of state for 999 years so now let us see some more details about the river see the river is about 140 miles or 225 kilometers long the periyar lake lies at the elevation of 850 meters the periyar lake is 31 square kilometers in area and is an artificial reservoir for a dam it lies between mountain peaks and is surrounded by a wildlife sanctuary some of the water is diverted to the vaihai river through a tunnel for irrigation just south of the mullai periyar reserve a 350 square kilometers of rainforest exists other significant feature is that tatekat bird sanctuary it is one of india's prominent bird sanctuaries the thick evergreen forest or home to several species of birds so that's all about this news article discussion in this news article discussion we discussed in detail about periyar river and then we saw in detail about the mullai periyar dam so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article this news article talks about the 5g services see the telecom operator bharati airtel will start rolling out 5g services this month and this is to cover all towns and key rural areas of the country so this is the crux of the news article given here so as part of this discussion let us see some important points about 5g technology from prelims perspective see 5g as the name suggests it is a fifth generation mobile technology see as you know the cellular communications network are known by their numeric generations that is 1g 2g 3g 4g and 5g the g here stands for generation so what do they mean by generation well connected to the internet the speed of your connection is determined by the signal strength which is showed next to the signal bar on your home screen of the mobile in alphabetical order such as 2g 3g 4g and so on 
So here each generation is defined as a set of tele network standards that describe how a specific mobile phone system is implemented technologically. So here as our internet speed requirement changes the technology used to achieve that speed also changes. For example 1G provides 2.4 kilobytes per second, 2G provides 64 kilobytes per second and is based on GSM. 3G provides 144 kilobytes per second to 2 MB per second and 4G provides 100 MB per second to 1 GB per second and 4G is based on LTE technology. So the next upgrade to this is 5G. Currently we are fully deployed in 4G and 5G is gaining ground. And the another major difference is the frequency used. See when compared to 4G technology, 5G uses radio waves of higher frequency. See in this image you can see varies from generation to generation and it is clear that the frequency of the radio waves used keep on increasing. This is because with increasing frequency more data can be transmitted. So with higher frequency also the 5G has the edge over other generations. So having this basic idea, now let us discuss about the advantages of 5G technology. See the first advantage is high data speed and data capacity. See due to its high frequency, the capacity of data that is transmitted is huge and the rate at which the data can be transmitted is also huge. So due to this property, 5G's ability to transmit huge data at a faster rate with low latency is possible. Here latency is how long it takes for data to travel between its source and destination. So lower the latency, better our experience. Second advantage is adopting 5G is cost efficient. See just now we saw 5G technology uses high frequency radio waves right and we know that frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. Due to its lower wavelength, the antenna that is used to transmit 5G waves is also smaller. So there will be higher coverage and due to higher coverage, the requirement of more mobile towers can be reduced. And because of these advantages, there are many different applications for 5G technology as well. Firstly, it helps in development of Internet of Things. See with the evolution of IoT, many additional applications like smart homes, smart cars can be developed. It is used in cloud computing as well. 5G also finds applications in augmented reality, remote surgery, factory automation, etc. And finally, before concluding, let us see the major disadvantage of 5G. First is dissipation of signal. See earlier while discussing the advantage, we might have had a question. If high frequency equals high speed and high data carrying capacity, then why don't governments offer even higher frequency radio waves for auction? See there is an issue in this. In the case of electromagnetic waves with high frequency, they get scattered very quickly. So to ensure transfer of data, direct line of sight between the antenna and the device receiving the signal must be ensured. This is difficult to ensure always. This is why there is a limitation in the frequency that it can be used in mobile networks. Since 5G has higher frequency, they are easily observed by humidity, rain and other objects when compared to 4G. So sometimes when you move away from the 4G, your cell phone automatically switches back to 4G. But this can be addressed by strategically placing tiny antennas in places where it is most needed. Second problem is that 5G technology will provide little value addition to normal everyday users. They only have very specific applications which will not seem attractive for normal consumers. So their adoption might become difficult. So these are the two disadvantages. So in this news article discussion, we saw about the 5G technology, we saw what is 5G, then we discussed some of its advantages and finally we ended by seeing some of its disadvantages as well. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the India-Bangladesh river agreements. See India and Bangladesh is likely to sign at least one major river agreement 
and the major rivers discussed in this news article are Kushiara, Ganga and Tista. Apart from the major agreements under discussion, sharing of data of river waters and better flood control planning are expected to feature in the upcoming meeting of the Joint River Commission that is JRC. See, this meeting is planned in the last week of August. That is why this article has made news today. So, in this context, let us learn about the rivers mentioned in the news article and let us see what the news article says about the agreements involving these rivers. Firstly, let us take the Kushiara River. See, the Kushiara River is a distributary river in Bangladesh and India. It forms on the India-Bangladesh border as a branch of the Barak River. That is, the Barak River separates into the Kushiara and Surma. The water of the Kushiara originate in the state of Nahaland in India and picks up tributaries from Manipur, Mizoram and Assam. From its origin at the mouth of the Barak, the Kushiara flows westwards forming the boundary between India and Bangladesh. So you can see that in the map given here. And the news article says that there is a strong possibility that an agreement on the Kushiara river will be concluded in the JRC meeting. Then coming to river Ganga, see the Ganga basin overspreads in India, Tibet, Nepal and Bangladesh. Specifically, when you take India, it covers the states of Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Bihar, West Bengal, Uttarakhand, Jharkhand, Haryana, Chhattisgarh, Himachal Pradesh and Union Territory of Delhi. The basin is bounded by the Himalayas on the north. It is bounded by Aravalis on the west, by the Vindhyas and Chotanagpur Plateau on the south and by the Brahmaputra Ridge on the east. You can see that on the image given here. The Ganga rises in the Gangotri Glacier in the Himalayas in the Uttarkasi district of Uttarkhand. And at its source, the river is called as Bahirati. It descends down the valley up to Dev Prayag, where after joining another hill stream, Alaknanda, it is called the Ganga. So only when Bahirati joins with Alaknanda, then it is called as Ganga. The principal tributary is joining the river from right or the Yamuna and the Son. The Ram Ganga, the Gagra, the Gantak, the Kosi and the Mahananda joins the river from the left. The Chambal and the Betwa are the two other important subtributaries. Now regarding Ganga, the news article mentions that a major agreement involving the Ganga may also be taken up. This is because there is a strong urge to achieve a big river agreement ahead of Bangladesh Prime Minister Hasina's visit. Okay. Then lastly about River Tista, see regarding River Tista and the Tista agreement we have seen clearly in our Hindu newspaper analysis dated on June 20, 2022. So just go back to that video and once again revise Tista River. Now regarding the Tista River, the news article says that the Awami League government has been insistent on sealing the Tista Waters Agreement because this has eluded settlement so far. So from all these, it is understood that India has agreed to offer Bangladesh a package on river water related deals. This will be considered a significant advancement in terms of sharing of river resources with Dhaka. So let's wait and watch what happens. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice questions. See, we have four practice questions today. I'll be discussing three. One question will be the quiz question for you today. Now look at this first question. Arrange the following events in ascending order. First event is Pakistan Resolution. Second event is Cabinet Mission. Third event is Lucknow Pact. And fourth event is Radcliffe Boundary Commission. Choose the correct answer using the codes given below. Option A 3124. Option B 1234. Option C 3214. And Option D 1324. See if such a kind of question is asked in your preliminary examination. First try to find the first event and the last event. So here from the option you can say that the final event is Radcliffe Boundary Commission. Now the confusion for you is between the first event and the third event. Third event is Lucknow Pact and the first event is Pakistan Resolution. You have to find which one came first. See from our discussion obviously Lucknow Pact came first because it was in 1916. So you can easily eliminate option B and D. 
and if you have an idea just before radcliffe boundary commission the cabinet mission took place then you can easily arrive at the answer which is option a 3124 so the first event is lucknow pact then comes the pakistan resolution then comes cabinet mission and finally comes the radcliffe boundary commission so this is how you have to solve these kinds of questions now moving on to the second question this question is about periyar river consider the following statements regarding periyar river statement 1 the major tributaries of periyar river includes mullayar only statement 2 periyar river is a west to east flowing river and it drains into arabian sea see the correct answer for the question is option d neither one not two statement one is incorrect because the major tributaries include mullayar cherthoni perinjan kutti and edamala rivers so naturally first statement is incorrect second statement is also incorrect because here the second part of the statement is alone correct yes it drains into the arabian sea we saw that in the discussion itself but it is not a west to east flowing river rather it is a east to west flowing river so the correct answer for the question is option d neither one nor two now moving on to the third question this question is about river ganga ganga is a result of the confluence of rivers option a bahirathi and alaknanda at devprayag option b bahirathi and alaknanda at karnaprayag option c bahirathi and alaknanda at gangotri and option d bahirathi and alaknanda at rudraprayag see the correct answer for the question is option a bahirathi and alaknanda at devprayag we saw that in the discussion itself right actually there are panch prayags now take this also as a task today and find all the panch prayags so the question displayed here is the mains question for you today just go through the question collect the points as much as possible try to write an answer and post that also in the comment section so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar rais academy youtube channel thank you